session. Uh, my name is Alok Shursagar. I'm a senior partner uh, with McKinsey & Company. Uh, we're privileged to have a very distinguished and uh, interesting uh, group of panelists, uh, as you can tell uh, from the profiles. Uh, and uh, we hope to have a very specific discussion uh, on the issue of solutions to restoring investor confidence. I think we've spent a lot of time uh, in the last uh, day or so talking about all the issues, the need for reboot, and all of the issues associated with that. Today, we will spend this session sp focusing quite a lot on what are the specific actions that have been taken and can be taken. And all of us on the panel are going to be quite uh, clear in providing examples rather than theory as a way to make this discussion uh, come alive. So even as you think about the questions or the contributions you want to make towards the end, let's try and make this as granular and specific as possible. So in that context, rather than opening statements, I think we've agreed as a panel that we're going to actually go through some very specific questions based on uh, everyone's background as a way to do a quick round of opening statements. I'll then follow up with another round of questions based on those statements. Uh, and then do two or three rounds like that, and then open up uh, for questions uh, from all of you uh, to sort of round out the last 15 minutes. So with that in mind, Neeraj, you've uh, obviously looked at various Indian companies at this early stage, mid-stage, late stage. When you have examined whether to invest in an Indian company, what has distinguished those that have given you confidence on their ability to manage risks in the Indian environment? Thank you. Um, so maybe just to address that, I'll just uh, talk a bit about private equity in India and how one views investments and then talk a bit more about specific risk profiles. So, you know, risk profile, private equity in India has by and large disappointed so far, right? It came of scale in 06, 07. No one's actually, funds have not really made money uh, in, in India so far. And uh, LPs by and large are quite disenchanted with the, the returns they've got from their India investments. Uh, I think the, the reason the market has been tougher for most funds in India is multifold. The, the, high, the main reasons, one is this market is characterized by higher valuations. That's partly because private equity or funding, private funding, institutional funding came of scale ahead of the maturity of the market. Um, I think secondly, it's been dominated by public investments, uh, which most investors believe they can do themselves without having recourse to private equity. And I think the third is the Indian promoter is somewhat more of a unique beast uh, compared to, uh, you know, U.S. or European management teams, there's a, there's, a, there's a stronger sense of control around the business. There's, a, there's, there's definitely a sense that they don't want to let go. And within that context, the question is, why is India positive, right? I think from a private equity or an investing perspective, one is the growth in the economy. Uh, even whether you take 5 or 6 percent or 7 percent, the fact is within that you'll find companies which are growing at two or three times. A 15 to 20 percent growth uh, allows you to create sizable enterprises, allows you a lot of uh, margin for error as well. Uh, within these businesses if your management teams are not executing. Um, I think secondly, in India, because the promoters own such a large ownership stake in their companies, the alignment uh, is much higher than what you find in the U.S. as an example where a CEO might own uh, less than 5% of a company. And, and then the third thing is I think Indian businesses by and large have figured out um, how to sweat their assets a lot more. So that translates into higher return of equity, higher return of assets uh, in the market. So I think that's sort of the macro perspective on, on, on private equity investing in India. I think on specific investments, um, w what at least we look for, one is the overall growth profile of a company, which you can, you know, from, from, from sort of reported financial statements, operating metrics. Secondly, in India specifically, we put a lot of emphasis on corporate governance. Uh, you know, that for us is, uh, you know, in terms of the general reputation of a business family, the fact that they've dealt with their partners uh, credibly in the past is a very important uh, facet of, uh, you know, what we look for in our, in our deals. And thirdly, sort of a, a realistic picture of how this business might uh, transform in the next three to five years. A lot of people have very extravagant plans about how the businesses can be built. That doesn't necessarily create, create private equity shareholder value, but someone who has a more methodical plan for how they're building this. Thank you, Neeraj. Joseph, you're an example of someone who's built a business from scratch and created markets from scratch at MCX in the commodities and futures marketplace. Perhaps could you talk about the journey of in building that marketplace? How have you managed the risks along the way and created returns for your investors? Yeah, I think it all began with a single policy decision that, you know, India must have markets. And that policy decision not only created markets, 
but much greater penetration through the support system that we created. So A, I think the key message is, even if a small decision is taken by the government on policy front to say a sector is important or an initiative is important, it creates much greater you know, uh, business opportunity around that sector. Uh, what we did was we probably two things that were required was technology and domain and we, that was our core. So we took this decision that we will actually create a market and we will look at, you know, there were two constituencies, constituencies which are going global. They were participating in these markets, but globally. So how could we give them a competitive market so that they can trade in local currency in local time? Uh, secondly, they had reasons to go out and so they were doing it in the evening session, so we created an evening market. So we kind of replicated the global market by giving them that time, that cost, that technology. And we kind of made it difficult for them to take a decision not to participate here and go out. We got unique people inside and where we sp had to spend a whole lot of money on education. So because these were people who didn't understand technology, didn't understand marketplace as clearly, and we had to actually go and build, uh, brick by brick build, uh, you know, uh, understanding amongst these people how the markets operate. Third important thing that we did was, you know, when we could look at a bird's eye view, we knew that merely explaining market was not sufficient. They needed a whole lot of support, which one point of view we could have taken is that this support had to come from the government institutions, and we could have held back ourselves and said, let the market mature in their own piece of time. What we did was we actually proactively went and created those businesses. And so while the warehousing regulator came much later, we land up creating a whole lot of warehousing space, space for spot market, space for education, and they were, these are all independent businesses thriving on their own, but actually created for the purpose of supporting this market. So we actually looked at the value chain perspective and created everything else. Logically, we moved in now ahead as stock exchange, and we said, having penetrated the country, what else does the country need? They need financial services. So now we're setting up the stock exchange. <coughs> On the same value chain, we will go and spread this financial services. Uh, we've got the best of the class investors in the promoting exchange. Now it's a listed enterprise. And the stock exchange is relatively new. We are operating for four years in currency, and we will be starting stocks shortly. So I think that's a short story. We've managed to integrate the bank, the foreign players, and the large domestic market. Thank you, Joseph. This theme of building out the value chain is obviously an important element of building out a successful uh, hotels and hospitality business in, in, uh, in India as well. Basant, as you think about India relative to your other emerging market investments, what are some things that have worked for you in terms of building the local partnerships with the supply chains? And any thoughts in terms of how you think about investments in India relative to other markets for Starwood? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> from, a, from a hotel standpoint, you know, a, a statistic that you may or may not know is it, it is the most under-hoteled market in the world. And uh, one of the statistics that's often thrown around is there are as many hotel rooms in all of India as there are in New York City. Um, so the opportunity is, is vast. The other thing about hotels is that um, it, it is a phenomenal business for what India is trying to do. You know, it's a tremendous job creator, first as a construction um, job opportunity, and then as a service sector job opportunity. And it doesn't, you don't need a big education to work in the hotel business. As, um, as you know, you need to have the willingness to work hard. You have to, you know, um, have some inclination to, to work with people. Um, and then any, any modern economy, um, you know, when I was growing up in India, there was a view that five-star hotels are the playgrounds of the rich. Most of you who travel on business know that there's nothing very glamorous about business travel, uh, <laughs> quite the opposite. 75% of our business is all about business travel. Um, you know, hotels are the lifeblood of any modern economy. You have to allow people to get around if you're going to do business. Um, and then they're a major source of uh, money, people visiting the country, um, you know, spending money and creating jobs, as well as um, just the they're an integral part of infrastructure. If you're going to build roads and airports, you need hotels. So on a variety of fronts, uh, this is, in our view, um, you know, the third largest market in the world. Our largest market is the U.S. China is our second largest market today. This isn't the third largest market, but should be. The issues, of course, are that they're fairly similar to the issues you have in anything to do with infrastructure. Um, Things move slowly. Land acquisition is hard. Um, the permitting process, etc. Our business model is adapted to work in all parts of the world because you can't be good at 
real estate in Shanghai and Mumbai at the same time. So our business model is to work with local partners. So we work with people who are in the real estate business, who acquire the land or have the land, build a hotel, and you know we run the business for them. Um, that business model, you know, generally works well most parts of the world, and and the important part there is finding the right people to partner with. Um, the issue for us, of course, has been that things have not moved um, as fast as we would like uh, for uh, a variety of reasons, but they're moving. Uh, the opportunity remains um, quite substantial. Um, steadily, as you all know, the the stock of better quality hotels is growing in India. Um, you know, by way of comparison, we have today over 100 hotels open under our brands in China with another 100, 100 under construction. In India, we're about a third that, um, and probably about, you know, another third uh, under construction. So on a scale uh, basis, um, you know, it's well on its way to being an important market, but slower than we would like. Tiger, you have the distinction of having built effectively a global company from India. And as you now reflect upon the experience of perhaps five or ten years ago persuading people why they should continue to invest in your India operations, to now a perspective where you're probably now making decisions between India and other markets to invest in, could you perhaps talk us through how you've made those decisions a few years ago versus now, giving you different vantage points? So I think if we dial the clock back 15 years back, uh, for the type of business we were in, uh, there was no option but but India. Um, at the same time, all the infrastructure issues, et cetera, that I think Vasant referred to were there. So the only way we dealt with it was actually looked at the supply chain and said, we will create and manage the supply chain ourselves, whether it's transport, power, roads, keeping the roads the way they should be in order to make sure the transport actually works, everything we took over ourselves. Uh, now, that model works up to a point because as costs rise, your efficiency of running it yourself declines. Uh, and then at the same time, as time passed by, that happened, other markets also started rising, whether it's Philippines or it's, you know, other Southeast Asian countries or, you know, uh, Latin American countries that can deal with the U.S. for some of the work that we need to do, et cetera. And over time, actually, some of the work being done in markets in the U.S. itself for U.S., uh, and when you have the cost structure change, plus you have the issue of not being able to bring talent in fast enough, scale enough to be able to do the work without having to train them again, you start changing the cost equation. So that has changed. It's not changed to a point where actually India is unattractive. I think it's hugely attractive. The higher the value chain of the work, the more attractive it is, which is great. Uh, but I think there are more choices that uh, that we make, there are more choices that clients make. Um, interestingly, the choice is less about India. Uh, once you decide you want to get here, uh, it's more about the micro segment of India. Which city, which sub-segment of which city, which state, what type of work. Uh, so, on, so once you decide it's India, then the decision is exactly which granular segment of India. However, the reverse is not true, which is if there is a shadow on India, then it kind of clouds everything. And I would classify the last 18 months as you know, kind of a shadow on many things, whether it's two power outages that you know, cut off power one third of the country. You have people saying, wow, you know, I don't care how good it is in one micro segment. I'm just not interested. So, so I would say the, the risk return equation of investment is when you have a negative, it kind of clouds everything. When you have a positive, it doesn't, it doesn't make everything positive. It's the micro segment that becomes positive. Just building on that point, uh, Anil, when you think about this idea of the micro-segments, that's been a theme that at least we've also seen in many markets, that it's not really the market but the segment. How do you look at this when you look at companies that operate across multiple emerging markets? And any implications as we go back to the overall theme of how to improve India's investor confidence? Yeah. So actually, I mean, you know, just to put things into broader perspective, you know, from my role as an academic, uh, is that... Uh, the uh, in terms of investment coming into uh, India, uh, FDI is much, much more important uh, than FII. While clearly both are important, FDI creates more jobs, 
uh, affects you know, uh, the country longer term, uh, it's more sticky money, et cetera. But even more important perhaps than that is that FDI is really, let's say, quote unquote, smart money. It's not just money, it brings technology, organizational capability, global connections, and so on, et cetera. And I think if I look at FDI, you know, and, uh, you know, as professors, you know, we, of course, uh, have to give grades, and you look at, you know, various components of a, quote-unquote, student's performance, uh, that, you know, when I look at India's FDI performance uh, across many dimensions, uh, the best that grade that one could give would be a C, you know. And uh, so just to put some numbers, uh, uh, you know, behind that, uh, is that, uh, you know, we know uh, the first half of 2012, you know, FDI figures for India, minus 43%. Versus global, uh, you know, minus about uh, nine or ten percent. Uh, even uh, uh, global emerging markets, minus ten percent. India, minus forty-three percent. But actually, if you take a three or four-year perspective, uh, is that you know, FDI to GDP, uh, inbound FDI to GDP flows uh, 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 into India. Two thousand eight was three point three eight percent. Then uh, you know, going on year by year, two point six three percent, one point four one percent, one point six three percent. So it's been declining as a percentage to our GDP. If we compare India to other, uh, you know, peer uh, group, China, Indonesia, Brazil, you know, which are all relevant peer, or of course the worldwide, is that India's FDI flow in, inflows to GDP, 2011, for example, are 1.63%, worldwide 2.2, China 1.76, Indonesia 2.23, Brazil 2.76, you know. And so if we compare India historically, last five years, we look at India this year, we look at India to world, we look at India to peer, uh, countries, uh, we look at India's FDI to GDP, you look at any number, uh, the best grade that one could give would be to a C. So then the question is, what could one do about it, you know, what's causing it and what one could do about it. And I think I would start by, you know, strongly <coughs> reinforcing uh, what Tiger just said, uh, is that the India brand does matter a whole lot. And that the first, you know, when I talk to companies and just, you know, over the last uh, couple of months, you know, senior executives of, you know, kind of the Fortune 50 multinationals, uh, and when I talk to them, so for instance, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, very large multinational, about 50 billion in revenue, uh, the global head of emerging markets, uh, and this person is based in Shanghai, so, and, and you know, uh, he's been based in, in you know, uh, in Shanghai, and he comes to India, you know, multiple times a year, etc. He knows India. But he said, look, you know, I know India, I, and I understand deeply what's going on, what the opportunities are, what the risks are, and so on. But I myself cannot make the decision. I ultimately have to sell to the corporate executive committee. And at that level, the deep, uh, uh, you know, depth of understanding about India, India, individual sectors, local markets, is still relatively weak. And so, therefore, the, the executive who is championing the decision may be very senior, maybe a member of the worldwide corporate executive committee, but he or she still has to sell to his colleagues. And at that level, brand image matters. Uh, and so, you know, Tiger's point, but, and it's only after a macro openness, willingness to say, yeah, it's time to invest in India, then the micro things about where in India, in which segment in India, et cetera, begin to become more important. And I think over the last two, three years, uh, and this year in particular, the India brand has taken a serious beating, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, and whether it's, you know, as you said, uh, you know, the, the, in the news about, you know, 600 million people without power, uh, you know, and you know, that doesn't, you know, go very well. Uh, and so the over, you know, over the last two or three months, uh, many executives have been asking me, you know, because I look at the emerging markets uh, across the board, so what do you think, you know, should we be investing in India or should we be focusing on Brazil or should we be focusing on Indonesia or China? You know, those are the kinds of questions that people are beginning to ask. Of course, you know, my answer is why do you have to make a trade-off because are you going to invest in Germany or in, or, you know, Germany is the strongest, but even then, you know, look, look at the growth rate. Are you going to invest in the U.S.? So to that extent, you have to focus on emerging markets, but, but companies are asking this question, you know, uh, India or you know, somewhere else. You know, maybe I, uh, that's a very, you know, the FDI point is a very important point, and, and I, I'll speak to it from the other side because for the last 20 years I've been mostly in American multinationals and on the other end of the decision of where to invest, um, and I've seen these decisions being made in the cola business, the snack food business, the fast food business, and now the hotel business. And, you know, the thing about FDI, and, and I don't know, um, you know, whether this audience includes uh, government officials and all that, um, 
FDI is the best kind of capital you can get. Many of you know that. Um, it is very patient capital. And every, every time I was involved in these decisions, they were made with 40-year time horizons. Uh, these are companies that have been around for 100 years, many of them. Uh, they expect to be around another 100 years, and they believe that being number one or number two in India is important to that. 40-year time horizons, far better than FII, which is hot money. Um, you know, the second thing about FDI is it's cheap capital. You know, most of these companies are cash rich. Their, their home markets, the U.S. or Europe, are cash generators. They have to find ways to invest the cash and grow their businesses. And their cost of capital is fairly low relative to local companies. The third is, it's, as you said, smart money. They don't just come with money like FII does. Um, they come with skills. They are here to build businesses and create jobs. Um, I have a somewhat more optimistic view about um, that whole side of things as it relates to India in that uh, they're willing to put up with a lot to be in India. And, you know, because of the long time horizons, at least the companies I've been involved in, it doesn't matter about, you know, a power outage that happened or whatever. They're looking at the very long term and the opportunity the market offers. So India always wins when it comes in term, when it comes to size, growth, etc. I think the issue has always been, it has always thwarted people's ambitions because of the difficulty of doing business, the time it takes to get things done, um, the difficulty of doing certain things depending on the nature of your business, meaning the bottlenecks that come from the things the government is supposed to do. Uh, in most countries, it is understood that the government provides, you know, a basic level of education, a basic level of infrastructure, you know, um, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Um, those are the, those are the problems. Having said that, um, I don't see any multinational that I've been associated with giving up on India or ever giving up on India, um, because you can't. Uh, if you expect to be in business 100 years from now, you know, unless you think something is going to go drastically wrong, uh, you have to have sizable businesses in China, India, and several other markets. The problem is that over the 20 years that I've been involved in these decisions, companies have alternatives. And they want to, you know, they're not just going to sit there. They're going to go where they can get things done. And India always loses out because it's harder to get things done. That's, you know, I think that's the problem that has to be solved because India has a lot of other things going for it. Talking about getting things done, Neeraj, as you think about your companies that you've invested in over the years, what are some examples of how people have got things done in India that could be replicated? So whether it's in terms of developing skills, their own local infrastructure that Tiger talked about. So give us some examples of that to get to Vasan's point on what can be done and what has been done. Sure. Um, just maybe one point on uh, what Vasant was talking about. I think actually for, even from a private equity perspective, India is a very attractive destination today. I don't think we could take the 100-year view because the compounded IRR over 100 years would be abysmally low. But I think from a, you know, from a private equity perspective, you know, valuations have come down today. India still, you know, it's, the index is trading at about 13 times PE uh, for a market that last year had earnings growth of 14% and historically has been at return of equity of uh, 18 to 20 percent. So now for, you know, the risk return is coming a bit more into alignment, at, at least on the pure uh, financial metrics. And I think secondly, um, you know, public market fundraising in India due to the volatility both in, in India as well as uh, global macro has limited the ability of companies to go out to the public markets and raise capital. So private equity has been uh, more dominant. So I think you'll actually see very good private equity deals being done uh, in the next couple of years. And I think with that statement, I just enjoy my, you know, I'll create job security for myself at least for the next two to three years. <laughs> uh, I think on specific, on, with the investments I've made in India, one is what the point that Tiger actually made. I think for the, for the good companies here, you actually try to both forward and backward integrate so you, you know, in the value chain, right? So as I take an example of a deal, uh, Apollo Hospitals is an example. You know, for them, it was the sort of nursing talent, getting doctors, and, and was, you know, given the churn, they ha not just they have, but hospitals have in India, that was the key requirement for them. So they actually started, they, they started developing their own nursing colleges. And I think that, you know, being able to captive, have a captive source of talent in India is very, very important. If you look at the scale of the, you know, a company like Apollo is growing at 25, 30%, and you, and you look at the build out of beds they're doing, you really need a large pool of physicians and nurses they can tap, tap into. So I think having a captive source of talent in that specific example 
uh, was very important. I think the best uh, Indian companies I've invested in have also actually gone against the sort of Western principle of being staying focused. They've, they've placed best bets across uh, adjacent markets which are paid dividends. So if you take, once again, taking the example of Apollo, they're obviously best known for, their, uh, for the hospital business they're in, but they also own a very large retail pharmacy business. They own a uh, healthcare, they used to own a healthcare BPO business. They've got a health insurance business. So they were playing in adjacencies where they were able to leverage uh, their management talent pool uh, as well as the, um, you know, the, the network and the connections they have had in place. So I think those are the two things we stand out when I look at the best deals which I have done in India where I see other my competitors and the best deals they've done. I think it's, it really comes back to A, having a captive uh, source of talent, and that could go back to Tiger's point around infrastructure as well. And the second is playing in adjacent markets. So if I can just connect one, one point between what Vasan said and what uh, Neerat said. I think, I think the mistake people could make is underestimate the importance of certainty in building a 40-year financial model. I, I completely agree with Vasan saying people do take long-term views uh, when they look at markets like India. The problem is if you have uncertainty, it's okay to have cost. And I think it's very important to understand it. It's okay to have a policy that comes out and say this is extra cost of whatever, tax, this, that, whatever. But tell us what it is because then I can build my financial model and make my risk return work. If you're not going to tell me that, and on top of that, if you're going to keep moving back and forth, including retrograde, I can't build a 40-year model. I'd like to build a 40-year model. I'd like to take a lower return, and still I'll find India attractive. That's the bigger issue. So I it's agree. indecisiveness, and it's uncertainty, and it's actually, in some cases, as we all know, retrograde. And, and, uh, Joseph, can I just, can I just yeah. sorry, uh, Joseph, you've had to live the world of uncertainty in regulation, whether or not you could even become a stock exchange. What are some things that you learned through that experience to what Tiger was saying? So you've had to live in a volatile, uncertain environment in your own business. What have you done to push through it? Uh, I don't think the example that I would cite would be very encouraging, but uh, <laughs> must tell you how we are throttling growth, uh, which, which is known to everyone. I mean, I would go back to my earlier example of that commodity exchange. Uh, when investors came in, they all knew that in a finite time period they would like to exit. So, you know, listing was important. Then we had to, you know, there are too many micro policies which govern an enterprise. So, you know, we begin by saying reforms. Reforms will be uh, major decisions. But then when those major decisions are being implemented at the grassroots, there are a lot of bottlenecks which are micro in nature, which would emerge not from that sector regulator or from the, sec from the relevant ministry, but from a whole lot, lot of areas where you are dependent on as an enterprise. So taking the example that, you know, that exchange had to list, so there was a listing policy that was required. That instead of happening in three years took seven long years. Uh, they came, investors came in, they thought uh, there were two segments of the market. There's futures, there's options. Options for 10 years, you know, we're debating and that legislation is still to be, you know, approved. So we're saying that, you know, uh, I think I take from the cue from what everyone is saying that when you look at a broad spectrum, any sector, you say the sector looks very attractive from the, you know, metrics that you would draw in terms of how much of demand will be there, how much can it pay off and things like that. But when it go gets into execution, there will be so many nuts and bolts. These can't be built into your model for a simple reason. Many of these things are treated as given, and you would encounter them when you're actually implementing it. Now, somehow in the entire system, there isn't an arrangement where bottlenecks get identified. So major policy decisions will be taken. It could be legislative. It could be executive. Having taken those broad decisions, if there are micro issues which need to get passed, there isn't a central agency which says, oh, this is a bottleneck. If this bottleneck was removed here, 10 other sectors benefit, and someone should focus on those bottlenecks. So I think a little bit of element to do with execution, and especially when people are talking about China and India, and I think this is where we are probably losing out. In China, they can see everything from value chain perspective, that if, if I take a decision that, you know, X industry should come, then I know all the pitfalls, and I will worry about all the pitfalls and see that everything is put in place. Here, we will say this sector is important, but pitfalls will possibly not be part of the policy. Pitfalls will be encountered, will be resolved case-to-case -case basis. And I think this is where possibly, I think, all these problems have got highlighted. The government is clear that we want employment generation, we want growth, we want foreign capital. Capital is chasing all this to be achieved. I think the last mile bit of execution, possibly from what debate that is happening in the country, probably everything has got agile. People have understood what the challenge. In fact, we've seen an institution now coming up which will ensure that policy execution of major projects will get done. I think we'll find, a, find an end to this particular challenge that we are facing. I mean, any investment issue. It's case after case. I mean, there's a, there's a power exchange that we've set up, in, which is based out of Delhi. This power exchange had short-term products, had long-term products. 
investors came in after two years. This power exchange is almost at 90% market share. Uh, the long-term products are dependent on being executed because there are two regulators which govern it. Those two regulators can take a decision because that decision needs to depend on ministry. There are two ministries to deal with it. It's been almost three years now, and you know, we're still working through it. So I'm saying these are realistic issues. These issues now have been understood, and we are now increasingly seeing that the government is worrying about execution, which deals with multiple ministries, multiple regulators, and how should there be an apex body which should resolve it. And I think we should have something in place. Anil, just to build on that, uh, other countries, like, for example, Indonesia, are actually spending a lot of time thinking about this administrative simplification, single windows for decision-making, so on and so forth, to deal with some of the issues Joseph talked about, which is we may think a sector is attractive, but the micro-execution and the administrative decision-making is extremely complex. Are there other such examples, Anil, that you would point to from your own work that would be relevant and helpful to India in terms of how to simplify the administrative complexity of policy? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, and, and you know, that connects with uh, two or three points I wanted to make about policy, and I've, you know, come to exactly this uh, question, is, you know, the, the one thing about when we look at policy is that policy, first, of course, policy may impose costs. Uh, that's not as bad as policy uncertainty, because typically the costs that come with policy uh, would apply to multiple players, or may apply to all the players, in it, and, and so in the end, those costs get passed on, if you will, to the customer. Uh, but it's policy uncertainty which hurts really because what companies do, investors do, both FDI as well as FII, but focusing on FDI, that when you have uncertainty, the hurdle rate goes up. Okay. And uh, so, of course, I mean, if the hurdle rate goes up, it, it either means no investment or less investment or only investment in the highly attractive projects rather than in a larger chunk of projects. Now, the, in terms of when you have multiple windows rather than a single window, uh, that not only imposes costs, but the moment you have multiple windows, every such window is essentially a degree of freedom, okay, to the bureaucrats, to the politicians, and so on, and that creates uncertainty. You know, just like, you know, if you, if you look at uh, a supply chain, you know, if you've got 20 links in the supply chain, things can go wrong at any point, versus you have only one link in the supply chain. Uh, and so I think the, the single window, yes, uh, its benefits are in terms of expediting the whole process and the cost of time uh, that is eliminated. Uh, but in addition to that, I think a, a, perhaps an even bigger advantage from a single window opportunity or single window approach is the reduction in uncertainty. You know, you face it once, and once you are, you know, beyond it, you know, uh, then essentially uh, there's massive uncertainty reduction. And the, to, to build on, uh, on, on that, you know, you talked about Indonesia. China has done that uh, very nicely. Other countries, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, you know, if you look at countries in our neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, that approach has been followed. And, you know, I, two, two things I want to say in terms of from a normative point of view uh, is that the first, uh, should India, uh, and, you know, the whole idea of uh, special economic zones or the, the NIMZs and so on, et cetera, you know, that's been on the table. But uh, the... Uh, you know, for instance, like what China did. Uh, so back in 1992, you know, in collaboration with the uh, Singapore government, one of the first SEC, uh, SEZs was, that was set up was Suzhou Industrial Park. And so therefore, should India, could India set up as a model? You know, I'm not saying it, you know, you, you need to do JVs for uh, SEZs in, you know, 20 places, but one of them. And let's say uh, uh, as a joint venture with the Singapore government, and why not with the Chinese government? because China has massive experience. Uh, and so, so that will be a huge learning opportunity for India. You do it once, and the rest you do on your own. You don't need uh, JVs for that. But the branding implications of that also, I think, would be very, very good. So that's one point. The second point is that, you know, if I just reflect on my conversations over the last couple of weeks with the senior executives from some big companies, is that the, and when they, uh, spec, you know, talked about their perspective on FDI in India is that aside from all the policy issues, what restrains or constrains the amount of money that they are able to put in India is the lack of an ecosystem, you know, from a supply chain point of view. Now, in some cases, if it's talent, uh, then, you know, as in the case of Genpact, you, know, you can invest and you can build uh, that ecosystem. But if you are, let's say, one of the biggest aerospace companies, and what you do is build planes, uh, and you need 
of course, a, you know, uh, subsystems and you need components. And, you know, and the company is not going to go into uh, internal, uh, uh, internalized manufacturing of the subsystems and components because that's not part of the company's strategy. So in India, we don't, you know, so, so what the executive was saying, okay, so the government says, okay, you know, we encourage. But encouraging FDI just for our little bit is not enough because the cluster is weak. Another company, one of the biggest telecom equipment manufacturers in the world that currently don't do manufacturing in India, that would have been looking at doing manufacturing in India, and they are doing something. But they said we could do a whole lot more if, you know, that cluster. So therefore, the policymakers, in terms of uh, making the country more attractive uh, to FDI, uh, need to think in terms of policies that are at the cluster level. Uh, rather than sort of at the micro level. You know, we want car companies to come, or we want an airplane manufacturer to come, or we want a telecom equipment manufacturer to come. To really, we want a whole cluster, if you will, and players in that cluster to come. I think it's a very powerful point, Vasant. You made that point as well in terms of how you think about building out your hotels with local partners. To Anil's point, what things are you doing or considering to build the clusters, the right quality of supply chain, the right quality of experiences, so on and so forth, in order to maintain your global brand quality? Well, uh, you know, we are uh, putting a lot of infrastructure into India that supports our business. So, for example, we're going to handle all our calls in India um, instead of, a, in, in, instead of uh, sending them outside India, which most hotel companies do. We, we have a local call center. Uh, we have a local sales force. A lot of hotel companies will have one global sales force. So we have a lot more training on the ground in India. So we're laying the groundwork for a very large business in the long run. Um, you know, there is a decent amount of um, hotel training that goes on through institutes and all that. What we can do is supplement that. Um, so, th you know, we don't need the same kind of complex ecosystem that a uh, big manufacturing industry needs. Uh, our needs are... Uh, a little different and, uh, you know, in some ways a little easier to, to get going. Um, but, you know, going back to uh, the points that I think both uh, Tiger and others have raised is, um, you know, given that risk and return is the big item of discussion, there's only one thing that I, I think the single most important thing that could be done is to reduce the uncertainty. Um, more than anything else, you can talk about all the other problems, but Businesses can work around them. You know, if you, if you have uncertainty on cost, uncertainty on time, uncertainty on the legal and regulatory framework where the assumptions you made about the profits you might make are not, are not right, that's a killer. Um, and that, I think, in the end is probably the single biggest issue that investing in India entails because your assumptions are wrong far too often on time, cost, and what the framework is, which is not true of almost everywhere else in the world. So it is not, you know, you don't have to go all the way into incredible complexities of we don't have the right infrastructure, we don't have this, we don't have that. Many of those things are true. But if you took the uncertainty away, people will find ways around them as you have. So, so I'll give you one example, which is actually a fascinating example. It's actually a reasonably recent example of ours. So we, you know, to do something, we needed an approval from 12 countries for some of the things that we needed, and it was a regulatory approval from 12 countries. We submitted it in 12 countries on the same day. 11 of them, when we submitted it, came on the spot and told us, 15 days, whatever number of days later, you will get an answer. If it's a yes, it's fine. If it's a no, you'll be told that day what you need to do in order to change, and another seven days. So total 21 days, it'll be yes or no. <laughs> in India, when we submitted it, we got, a, we got a stamp back saying, received on so-and-so date. So it was confirmed that it is received. In fact, the time was also stamped. But you don't know when you're going to get it back. Uh, the, it's, and, and again, I go back to what I think I said. I'm going to repeat it, which is it's less important uh, as to exactly how much time it takes. 28 days is fine, but tell me it's 28. And two, I think the importance of time is misunderstood. The world is becoming faster. Cycle times are becoming faster. Technology, I mean, it's all, everything is speed. The importance of speed is, I think, not fully understood by, by almost anyone. So, and I think that's a big difference in almost going into any emerging market. Forget developed economies. Emerging markets today are all competing on speed. 
And I think we are losing competitive edge on speed dramatically. Neeraj, what do you think about that point around speed? Are there people who've managed to, in certain geographies or local markets, get much faster uh, actions done? Are you seeing real differences between the geographies on that? No, I'm just, I mean, as I think Taigo was referring to, you look at some of the stats around India, right? It's, I think, the ease of doing business now, we're 132 out of 185 countries. On um, the Transparency International Index, which ranks how corrupt a country is, where um, 95 out of 185. I think uh, Bain did some work for the Planning Commission. It takes 150 approvals to set up a business in India. So, I mean, I, I, speed is, you know, I, I don't think we're talking about speed here. Right? We're talking about the ability to get something done in India in anyone's conceivable time frame versus I think if you, you know, we have, we invest out of an Asia fund and you look at China, right? Their ability to, you know, if you look, we have investments in hotels and budget hotels, right? The ability, with the speed at which they're rolling out a hotel a week. Right? And, and it's both about having a single window clearance. It's about having certainty uh, around policy. Um, and it's, it's, it's about having government officials or ministries which are supportive of business. Right? So I've seen it. If you look, you know, we, we've done a lot of investing in China. We've done a lot of investing in Indonesia. And in certain key segments, which I don't, it's not true for all segments, but in certain key segments which are important for the national agenda, like healthcare for them, like education, uh, they're very supportive. And actually, this whole concept of single window clearance, providing subsidies, capital subsidies, uh, providing the appropriate management talent is something they, you know, they, they do quite aggressively versus you look at the Indian context, right? I mean, I think everyone wants the government to just stay out of the way. I don't think you necessarily want the government to support you. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be great if they can do something supportive, but at, at minimum they should stay out of the way, and I think that creates certainty from a policy regime. Uh, this whole concept of retroactive taxation has got everyone spooked uh, internationally, right? The fact that you're willing to go back to 1962 and look at what has happened, I mean, that's admirable in a certain degree, but it's also pretty scary. But I think as long as the government stays out of the way, I think there's enough entrepreneurship in India, the entrepreneurial talent pool is enough, and the opportunity is big enough that people will uh, execute. But you require certainty and less government involvement. Okay, I'm going to suggest we open it up uh, to, the, uh, to the floor for a few questions. Go ahead. Specifically on uh, corporate governance and also given FCPA and UK Bribery Act, which have long arm jurisdiction, which is a concern, a great concern to foreign investors. How do you due diligence it? How do you mitigate around such risks? And also regulatory. I mean, we've all touched upon the point um, now retrograde, Vodafone being the big, uh, you know, gorilla in the room, of course, and also the 2G scandal, which has left a lot of foreign investors burnt, and also the image it has to brand India which we talked about a little earlier, so to sort of focus more on that. Yeah. I, I can take it from a, you know, we look at a lot from a, from a private equity perspective, right? Um, actually, before I do that, I, this, we, I, I polled 700 of our uh, limited partners who are, who are investors in Carlisle about what was, when you mentioned India, what, what were the top three things which came to mind? And this was in September. This was before the spate of policy uh, reforms came through. But the top three things came, which they had uh, top of mind for them was slowest growth in 10 years, uh, corruption, and policy in action. So when, I think when we talk about brand India, we should recognize what it stands for today. I, I think you know, it's a huge market, tremendous potential, but I think this is the same story we told five years ago. Uh, we're saying that you know, we're giving the same story right now. And that ties into your point or, around corporate governance. I think in India, uh, the perception has been that corporate governance is a win-lose mechanism, so the investor coming in will benefit with uh, uh, better corporate governance and the, the promoter or the company actually loses out. If you actually look at the stats around this, right, which is there's a lot of work done around this, co com companies which are regarded to have better corporate governance grow at faster rates than the peer group. Investors are willing to pay a premium to get into those companies, and actually strategic investors coming in later will pay a premium to, uh, to buy those companies out. So there, there, there's a real benefit to uh, improving corporate governance. I think from specifically in the private equity world, the whole Lilliput scandal has left a big mark uh, on India. It's not like this doesn't happen in other geographies. There's a very uh, high-profile case of a company called Canopy Networks in the U.S. where you know, investors put in $90 million, and the, the company CFO basically took KPMG letterhead and put his, his financials on that and said these are audited financials. So it's not, it's not like it doesn't happen, but in the Indian context, when you have a, a corporate governance fiasco, it just gets that much more profile. I think the way we deal with it as private equity investors, one is you put a lot of uh, emphasis on the informal networks and the feedback you're getting on companies. And generally, if that's negative, you don't want to work with them. We're spending a lot more time on forensic diligence. So you know, if, if, if companies in retail and they claim they're going 20% a year, 
there should be customers coming to the store and buying stuff, right? So you, you actually go and check that. Uh, and thirdly, we put a lot of, you know, like you said, you do uh, forensic diligence, you get uh, people like control risk to actually uh, make sure there's no uh, uh, red flags which come out. And generally, if there are red flags, they're true. So we, we you know, we, I, I would tell you in the last, since the post-Lilliput world, we're spending an inordinate amount of time on the forensic side of, of, of diligence. Tiger, why so, uh, so if I can just, Tiger and then Vasant. So, yeah. so if I can just, uh, you know, push back a little bit on, not push back actually, you're right on, on uh, corporate governance and corruption and integrity and all of that. The reality is, you know, talent and the ability to, to learn and lead, this is one of the best markets in the world. Forget emerging markets. Uh, so if you can create the culture where it is actually one of the best in terms of integrity, governance, etc., then actually we, find, we have found over 15 years that actually you can then take that and use that and implant it into other countries uh, where it actually makes it a competitive advantage in the world. Uh, so one, one shouldn't make the assumption that, that there is something like India corporate governance. I think it's specific company corporate governance. Uh, and then it's a question of can you create it? And once you create it, it actually becomes a competitive advantage across the world because the ability to then use and standardize processes and the ability to actually drive discipline once it gets incorporated is actually better than many other places. Uh, FCPA, I, I think, is going to become a, a major factor in investment decisions as it relates to India. As a U.S. public company, um, you know, boards have significant liability. Uh, I think FC, the, the effects of FCPA, I don't think, have been fully felt on investment decisions, and they will be. Uh, it will be a major factor in decision-making for U.S. public companies and <clears throat> where they invest. <clears throat> and, and I think it comes back to the element of unpredictability. As a U.S. public company, you spend a lot of time building walls around and making sure that you are as far away from corruption as you can be um, because it exists in a lot of places you do business, so you put walls around it. You need an element of predictability about corruption, too. The unusual thing about India is we've, democ democ we've got the democracy, but we've also democratized corruption. Um, it's incredibly democratized in India in the sense that it is pervasive. How do you put walls around it? That creates an element of risk and uncertainty that I don't think has been appreciated yet and will be a massive chill on investment in India. It'll be a huge factor in our decision. Go ahead. Andy. Just, just to, you know, I mean, put India in the context of other countries. I think, uh, of course, you know, corporate governance uh, doesn't affect FDI decisions as much as it affects private equity and FII decisions. But I think on corporate governance, while, you know, clearly uh, India is far from perfect, uh, that if I compare India to other emerging markets, uh, certainly to China, to Indonesia, to other markets, actually India's corporate governance is better. Uh, so I'm not too concerned about corporate governance uh, as such, uh, you know, in comparison to other emerging markets. The, in terms of the uh, uh, FCPA, uh, the, you know, that clearly is an issue, uh, and it's an issue uh, with respect to India. It, it's, an, you know, it, it's, it's a question with respect to virtually every emerging market because they're all competing to be, you know, in terms of who can be the most corrupt, uh, you know, and including China. And, you know, in China you have command and control in a political uh, you know, in terms of the political system, but corruption is as democratized in China uh, as it is in India. So companies face that issue, and when I talk to, to senior executives of, you know, peer companies uh, uh, of, of uh, people on the panel, uh, that, you know, there was a time, uh, maybe 2005, you know, Jim McGregor, uh, uh, he wrote a book about China, and there was, you know, thing about corruption. Uh, he said, you know, well, I won't tell you what to do, but essentially do what you need to do to succeed and donate to, to charity in your old age. Uh, but that was 2005. Today, uh, you know, if companies, American companies in particular, and similar uh, policies are getting enacted in Europe, uh, that if uh, they uh, get caught uh, engaging in corruption in violation of FCPA, uh, today the spillover implications globally uh, for the corporate brand, uh, aside from, you know, those are very huge. So today, you know, the, 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 the guideline uh, that I would give that I hear uh, executives saying is don't, uh, not today. The, the final point uh, is that, you know, in terms of that we, the, despite all the challenges uh, that India faces about FDI uh, that we have discussed is, you know, actually from the perspective of multinational companies, uh, you know, India still remains, despite all the challenges, one of the most attractive markets because 
virtually everybody believes that, okay, you have these problems, but you look out 2025, and you take a 15-year time frame, you know, uh, you know, which will be one of the biggest emerging markets. It will be one of the five biggest GDP countries and so on, et cetera. So, therefore, this could be India's golden moment, you know? Yeah, I think maybe just to take a contrarian view on this, I actually think that the FCPA is catalyzing a lot of change in the supply chain. So, in the work that we are seeing, yeah. the fact that you've got FCPA is now forcing yeah. people to clean up their business models, avoid unnecessary practices, and this is actually acting as a good hammer to avoid excuses that this is only the way to do business in India. So I think there's a contrarian view to this, which actually says that these sorts of actions can help catalyze the degree of change that is necessary just in just India. Just one more point on that. I, just, I mean, I, I guess where I disagree with the analysts, I, I don't think corporate governance is a relative issue. I don't think we can say we're, just because we're better than China and Indonesia, we're fine. I think it's more an absolute. And so I think we have to look at it from that perspective. I do think FCPA will have a huge impact. Uh, on companies, it, they, you see, you're seeing the signs of improvement. And I think the, uh, my, my, the point I made earlier, I think you have to position it as a win-win. It shouldn't be positioned as you have to do this so you get, you get the investment. There's a real story for companies to actually adopt better corporate governance. Yeah. Okay. And the back here. Go ahead. Uh, I'm PC Nambiar, the chairman of the Expert Promotion Council for Special Economic Zone and the EOUs in India. You mentioned about the SC set being the, you know, trial and error. You need not to. The SEZ is not a con new concept in India. From the last 40 years, government has run seven SEZ in this country. And the total investment they could achieve is less than 4,000 crores. 2005, the new SEZ Act came into being. For the last five years of operation, he brought more than 2 lakhs crores of rupees investment in this country. Now, to give figures, 588 SEZs have been approved. 386 have been notified. That means they land in that position and they planned everything. Only 161 is operation today because the internal ministerial conflicts. The SEZ, Special Economic Zone, which government feels is a baby of the Commerce Ministry, not the Finance Ministry. So first of all, government has to be one, cannot have two. We need to talk about the confidence level. When you have a conference level, you must find out that whether ministry, the government is one for the entire nation or are you going to have hair splitting in each activity, one, one, department, one, one ministry. Why don't you have one common face? Okay. Now come to exports. Sir, can I just ask, is there a question? Yes, sir. I'll tell you. He, he made a reference saying that whether the SE said with uh, uh, Singapore or China, we can have a collaboration and we can try and after that we can expand. You need not to. Your export performance here is 3 lakh 43, 43 lakh crores have been achieved last year. Even April, September, this year, there is a 36% growth achieved by SEZ alone in exports, whereas the entire export of the nation is showing a decline. So the proven record is that SEZ has to be one. SEZ need not be tried with somebody. Here is the internal expertise available. Internal strength is available government has to make up their mind whether you want it or not. As simple as that. Therefore, your submission, we do not have a collaboration. We have an internal strength. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Any other questions? Go ahead. <coughs> Sorry, there's a gentleman at the back, and then after that. Hi, Tridip Roy Chaudhary from Adobe Systems. Uh, great unanimity on the question of uncertainty and cost among the panelists. So the question that I had was, in your experiences, is this is not something that I think the people in the government possibly are aware of. The uncertainty cost, I think a lot of folks would have raised it with them. So in your experiences in dealing with governments and having experience with government regulations and policies, is the delay primarily because they're trying to over analyze it and trying to get this perfect policy in place? Or is it an attitude? And if it's the first one, is it a better idea to kind of get a policy which is a good policy, not to get the perfect policy and be agile about it and kind of look at it? Would like to get your Joseph, why don't you, why don't you start with that? Uh, I think, uh, you know, you're amongst the two suggestions, I would say uh, time is certainly not being valued today, and I would agree with the panelists, and I think it's one of the, if, if, if someone could actually do a study, we could find out how time could add probably a percentage to GDP. So time consciousness is extremely important. Uh, in terms of whether we get perfect policy or we get clearance, I think most of the time, uh, something when it becomes an impediment, 
the decision is not on a single table or a single individual. And that authority is actually not known. At what level is this decision going to be taken? So the challenge is, everywhere where you are stuck for a bottleneck, he would say that he himself is dependent on two other entities. So one really does not know where the buck stops. And if that clarity was available, that there was a nodal either ministry or an agency which says bottleneck of three ministries, you don't have to talk to three people, you just talk to one. And I think this is something which industry will never be able to resolve. It will have to be resolved by government considering this to be a bottleneck. And we want foreign capital to come, we want growth to take place, we want jobs to be created. What is the bottleneck? The bottleneck is not demand side. Bottleneck is also not supply side. You know, both of them are willing to come. I think this constraint of whether you call it uncertainty or to simply say that if you have a pitfall, I don't want to put all the, you know, all the factors in my model as of now, but if I land, land up having 10 factors which are unknown, I know that I'll be getting resolved because that overall mantra is we will make business easy. And I think that focus is missing today. Yeah, okay. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, I'm no expert on this, but it seems from watching this, you know, typically it takes two to three years for a hotel to go from a hole in the ground to a finished hotel in most parts of the world, and in some parts it's one to two years. In India, if you're lucky, it's six years. Um, and it appears from watching this that there are too many people who can say no, um, and they all have different objectives. There is no unified purpose, um, and almost anyone can get in your way if they want to. Uh, because if you're going to build something as complex as a hotel, there are many entities involved. They all have the right to get in the way, and they choose to. And none of them seem to have common objectives. You know, the interesting thing is, you know, we work with global corporations to actually fix their processes. The reality is lots of companies have the same problem. So it can be fixed, and it's exactly the two things that, one, do you measure it, and do you consider it important, so time, and two, you know, what is the process for taking that decision, and who are the people involved, and, you know, is there one owner who drives it through and then gets measured on that decision? I mean, it's actually pretty simple thinking that actually corporations use to drive themselves, because time is so important. Yeah, of course, the irony is that's exactly how companies like Genpack got built, right, <laughs> yeah. to provide that service. Other questions? Yeah. So my name is Harish Krishnan from Cisco. My question is uh, a lot of good feedback to the government, and I wish we had a government uh, representative on the panel. But I would like the panel to reflect on this question. Is the government cognizant of all this feedback? Are they doing something about it? Do you see any change uh, lately? Uh, are they, do they still think that uh, somehow the FDI is inevitable to India, as some, a couple of panelists in the, you know, mentioned? Uh, what is the uh, opinion on that? Can I just build on that question, if it's okay with you? Can we ask the panelists to answer both what can the government do as well as what can the companies do associated with that? It's not all the government alone. Maybe starting with uh, Anil and then we'll go down. I think uh, the, uh, you know, I mean, it, the, the, the point was made earlier that India has experience with SEZs. But the, I think the kinds of SEZs that we have in China, you know, that's a much, much bigger scale. And so when you have, you know, it's, it's, it's like almost a city, uh, you know, the, the Suzhou Industrial Park, it's, it's not a park, I mean, it's a city. And so when you have an SEZ of that scale, you have the infrastructure, you can build a whole cluster, and you can build single window clearance, but not just a policy single window clearance, you have actually the players on the ground in, within that SEZ. So I think that kind of an experiment has, I don't think, has been done in India. And, and that's a policy issue, clearly, the creation of that kind of an SEZ. And I'm not saying that we need, you know, 20 joint ventures, as I was saying. We need one uh, to build a showcase, not just a showcase for the world, a showcase for India. So then we say this is the way to do it, and then, you know, replication can be done. So I would say that's, you know, one way to reduce uncertainty, one way to reduce the cost of time, et cetera. Maybe, Tiger, just what could a company do, given this uncertainty, right, or what have you done? to try and push through despite the constraints that are... No, no, so I think I would say two things. One, obviously, you try and mitigate it yourself. You build it into your assumptions, and, and you still then push through and do, uh, you know, what, what, what you expect the government to do but couldn't do, and you do, and so on. But the, but the other thing which is equally important is you... I think it's all our responsibility for the people inside. I mean, there are people trying to come in from the outside. That's... Forget them. For the people inside... We all have to bring visibility to what is important, what is the current performance of that, how do you change it, and I think you've got to do that again and again and again, and you've got to do that collectively and as one voice. You've got to do that across multiple industries. At some point in time, that will have an impact. But 
I mean, let's just take uncertainty and time as two, two things and single, single policy clearance. Bringing visibility to that specifically again and again, I think, is very, very important. And we have the responsibility of doing that. Joseph, any comments? Yeah, I think going back to you. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir, please, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think we, you know, while we look at business, we look at it, a country as a single entity. But, you know, if we can just keep in mind, and I think this challenge is enormous. So there is a philosophical change in the way we manage decision making, which has to come. You have, you know, the, the government would take a decision. So, you know, policy comes out, legislative or executive. Then you have multiple ministries. And any large industry will be dependent on at least three or four ministries. You come down to the state, state level clearances. You come down to the city, you have the municipal corporation. All these things have to be done, and I think there is no way that you can draw a matrix which is time, cost, uncertainty, dependent, which says everything is known. There will be so many unknowns because all these things are also on a change. You know, they're also constantly changing. Given this reality, I think people have found, as, as we said, uh, I think, you know, Tiger made the reference to it, that one thing that we've done when there are policies are huge, and there is an understanding issue within the government, you get good research done, you talk to chambers of commerce, you talk to media, explain to them, give them global examples that this is the better possible to, possibility. So policy decision, I think, becomes easier because you can more scientifically pitch it to the government. But when it comes to execution, there is no way that you can say there are 100 parameters that need to change, and there is no single agency, believe me, even if the central government wants to say something should get done faster in the state, they can't possibly do it because there's a separate entity which does it. And if a state government chooses that something needs to be done at a pace, there is a local unit which has to work at its own pace. And I think this is a very, very large issue, which I don't think can get cleared, even if all the ills were known, until we decide that business is first. And if business has to be executed, then we are saying there's going to be an apex agency which says, which will cut across all these three layers of hierarchy and say, business first. Can it happen? Will it happen? I think it's a very, 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 very large, tall order or expect for us to have the same frequency across these three decision-making entities. Very, very okay. difficult. Okay. Any other questions? Just to pick up on uh, Nirod's point uh, earlier on, sorry, my name is Jeremy Garrett-Cox. Um, uh, you mentioned corruption, policy in action, and the sloth growth in 10 years as fear. If you roll forwards for 10 years from now, what would the panel's views be on confidence that anything that we are talking about today will have changed? You have the 40-year view. <laughs> so. um, ten, 10 years rather than 40. Yeah. I understand. Just. I, I, it's hard. It's hard to, these are, these are you know, going, the question here was, who do you, who do you give feedback to? Who's empowered to act? Um, I think there are massive systemic changes required it may it may never get to what you want it to be um, I, I don't think I have a prediction Maybe I, I, I am a huge optimist I think it'll change yeah and I think there are two drivers of that change one I think uh, I think people like us will push it and will push really really hard and two I think competitive forces are going to drive it really hard and I'm talking about two different competitive forces competitive forces of India versus China and all of that and where capital goes and where investment goes will drive that. I mean, look at the decision making over the last 60 days. It's competitive forces that drove it. And internal competitive forces will drive it. So while you talked about the three level hierarchy, there is very clearly a competitive force between investing in one city in a particular state versus some other city in another state. Over time, that disparity will grow. And as long as we bring visibility to why it's happened and why some decision was taken to move from one place to another, I think it will start driving that. So I'm a big believer that change will be even more rapid than it's been in the last 20 years. Neeraj? You know, so um, I'd want to believe what Tiger says. I think change <laughs> will be a, a lot slower. I think the, you know, the big change in India is that um, you know, the regional, the political landscape is very, very different. I don't see that changing. So the ability to drive through change either on in infrastructure or fiscal consolidation, which are the two big things which are required to really catalyze uh, the economy, are going to take a lot longer to happen. Uh, you know, with the references made to the last 60 days, but we've done it with our backs to the wall as opposed to a policy reform which has been proactive. So I'm less optimistic, even though the, the, you know, the, the better half of me wants it to happen. But I think, the, I think we will, India will grow. I don't think we're going to hit the 10% growth rates anytime soon. But I, what will attract foreign capital is, this is, as Anil said earlier, this is too an important a market for people to stay away from. Uh, uh, Multinationals do want to play in this market. I think you'll see them being a lot, lot more active in this, in this space. But the actual pace of changes, we're talking about it from a policy reform perspective, will be much more glacial. Anil? 
Yeah, I, I, I actually, I side with Tiger uh, in terms of I'm a huge optimist. And part of my optimism comes from what I would say the neighborhood effect. You know, it's just like the neighborhood that we are in forces us to benchmark against what's happening in China, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, you know, and and so it, 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 it's a great neighborhood. And I, you know, uh, go back to a statement that uh, is attributed to Anand Mahindra, you know, three, four years back, he said, for a country that invented yoga, uh, India didn't really learn to stretch until China forced it to. <laughs> uh, and so I think uh, yeah, that, that given the neighborhood we are in, and just look at, you know, the gloom and doom that exists in India this year, you know, that's at a five and a half percent growth rate. Uh, that's because our expectations are that we ought to be growing at 10. Uh, you know, and Brazil will grow at two. China, you know, officially maybe seven and a half, but real on the ground, maybe more like five. So I think this is good, you know, that to, to have gloom and doom at five and a half percent growth rate, to me, that's really the neighborhood effect. And I think that will continue uh, and that will have a positive effect uh, in terms of things getting sorted out. Okay, great. So I think I'm going to move to closing uh, statements. What I'd like to do is make the closing statements as action-oriented as possible. So I'd like each of the panelists We've all heard about the optimism. We all know the theory of the case. That's got, we've got that. I'd like each of the panelists to reflect upon, either from this discussion or your own experiences, if what would be two actions you take in the government and what would be two actions you take in your own companies or from your own vantage point to capture the opportunity of India? Neeraj. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so I, you know, I think from, I'll take a more private equity-led perspective, obviously. I think one is... Um, uh, we've talked about the overarching theme of uncertainty, so I'll put that aside. So certainty in the tax regime will definitely help private equity investing. I think uh, more specifically, uh, opening up domestic pools of capital, you know, insurance funds and pension funds in India are not allowed to invest in private equity or venture. Uh, so I think that needs to be uh, 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 opened. You know, if China has a massive sovereign fund. India should be in the same, same position. And I think, uh, secondly, uh, we need to improve the ability to delist uh, public companies. There are a lot of, you know, if you just look at the stock market, there are all these living dead companies, which the squeeze-out provisions are impossible in India, so we need to change that. Uh, from, a, from what we can do as private equity investors, I think was one is we need to emphasize the positives a bit more. I think Anil's made the point of relative to other markets, we're not as bad. I think that's important, uh, uh, both in terms of growth rates as well as the execution. I think, secondly, talking about the, you know, what we're still, I mean, we're, people are coming you know, are kicking their heels, are dragging into India to invest because they believe the potential of the market, right? They're not coming willingly right now. They say this is a big market. There's all this other crap which goes on. Execution is bad. There's corruption. There's no transparency. But it's going to be a big market, and so we should be there. And I think you continue to uh, uh, push that story down is number one. I think secondly, from uh, is really s s from an investment perspective, uh, seek out companies which have great corporate governance. I think uh, to the point Vasan made, I think in the next five years, companies which are regarded as blue chip corporate governance will accrue a greater shareholder value. Okay, great. Joseph, two actions on each side. Uh, I think two actions will be two less. So I would say, see, there is a new currency which is in vogue, which is called job creation. And I think this currency is understood by corporates, it's understood by political system. And I think globally and locally, this currency is going to be the driving force. And I think every decision is now going to be benchmarked, and there will be increasing pressure to benchmark against each entity which is into decision making. How are they helping the system to create more jobs? Because that's their vote bank. That's pro that prosperity is good for their country. And I think if we can determine decision-making based on this currency, which is happening, whether we like it or not as a policy, it's happening already. Uh, we've got states which have become very successful, driving only on this theme. And I think for corporate sector, this theme is going to be important. When, what we, when we go and communicate to the government, we say we are taking this action. This is going to create so much of job. This is going to create this uh, um, you know, economic opportunity. And I think, would you like to do away with it? And you have a firm belief, see, market is known to all of us. People who are doing business, they understand the market is there. The question is, do you want to put a time to it saying, I want to achieve so much in 10 years? Or we say, fine, we will reach there at some point in time, but there's enough to do even today. And so that continues to keep the corporates going. So continue to make suggestions, continue to tell them how much. Now every project that we do, we do a social audit alongside the project. And one of the impact of the social audit is, we don't talk about it, but an academic institution goes and talks to the government and says this project has created so many jobs, so much of entrepreneurial opportunity, it's good for the state. It just speaks for itself. So then you want 10 other things, you go and tell them these 10 things are required. Some would be from states, cities, regulator. There is a different constituency which is working towards. So I think if we can start changing the currency and start talking in terms of job creation as a single point of factor, I think we'll see a huge change in the country. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I, I would amplify on that. I think uh, there should be across all segments of Indian society and a real effort made by all elements, business, government, etc., 
to build a consensus which probably doesn't exist today that businesses create jobs. And yes, businesses make a profit. They take 10 or 15 percent at the, at the end, but 85 percent of what they do is jobs. That's the expense part of the business, and that's all jobs. That's one thing. And the second, as a multinational, I think to the extent that this still exists, I mean, multinationals are not a reincarnation of the East India Company. I think it's, it's time to get past that. It's far from it. They can create enormous value uh, uh, for India, uh, and we should get past that if that still is, uh, you know, hanging around in the background. Thank you. Tiger? And I'll just go back to my theme of, I think the government should, should understand the importance of speed and uncertainty uh, in almost every decision that is made and every process that is followed to, to execute that decision. Uh, you know, from our perspective, what I would, I think all of us should do is bring two types of visibility. Visibility that allows the government to understand benchmarks outside and therefore what is potentially possible versus what could be lost or what is being lost. And two, deliberately find a way to create internal competition, make one city fight against another city, one state fight against another state. It happens in China and I think it's a huge, op huge thing that actually makes a difference in China. Uh, you know, obviously there are things that happen at the, at the central level, but if you can make that happen, which I think is actually happening at the micro level, and then bring visibility to why, because just making it happen is not good enough. You've got to make the good versus the bad really visible. So the bad really feel bad and then try and become good. Okay. Anil? Yeah. The, I, th I think in India right now, uh, the, what we need is people in power. And by that, certainly, of course, you know, uh, the, 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 in politics, but also in academia, in India, the media, uh, corporate, NGO, for people in power to actually tell stories, stories about what's their vision for India. Because, you see, around a vision for India, you can bring people together and therefore begin to, uh, you know, build patience, begin to build tolerance for, you know, uh, for, 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 for different views. Otherwise, without that kind of a compelling vision, uh, what you really have is just a, you know, very factious uh, society. Uh, where, because you cannot bring about change, even FDI, in whatever sector, you know, it's certainly in the short term, it's not going to benefit everybody equally, even if it benefits everybody. So I think what we need is this kind of a storytelling. Uh, otherwise, everybody says, what can the country do for me, rather than what I can do for the country. Okay. Well, we're just going to be at the end of our time. I just think there are three or four important themes that emerged from this discussion. I hope you all enjoyed uh, and thank the panelists very much for their very specific examples and actions. One is this whole theme around speed, uncertainty, and time, and the importance of that, and making sure that we in India, whether you're dealing at the government level, competition between the states, and in how business acts with that, that notion of how to reduce time, reduce uncertainty, is an important one takeaway. Second takeaway, at least, I had was the notion of building partnerships that work. Right? So this is partnerships with the local government, partnerships with business and its supply chain in the way that uh, Vasan talked about or Joseph talked about to make sure that that actually happens, the Apollo Hospital example that Neeraj cited. And the third was building capabilities. Right? So these are things that actually need to get built in. So when you're making that investment decision, you're not just making it in terms of building a manufacturing plant, but also the supply chain, the cluster around it, making sure you're able to invest in people's skills and capabilities so that you're able to quite quickly overcome some of the constraints that exist. I think we're all excited about India as an opportunity. Hopefully this panel gave you some insights on the sorts of actions that would improve its uh, risk return and therefore investor confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you.